the powers that be haven't really fully wrapped their head around the fact that this isn't just, just because you're using the best, coolest, most advanced, most potent technology doesn't mean you're actually establishing value. You may be creating value, but capturing it requires change to business operations. And that's what the project needs to revolve around. Welcome to the Agile Digital Transformation Podcast, where we explore different aspects of digital transformation and digital experience with your host, Tim Butera, Content and Community Manager at Agile Drop. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm joined today by not one, but actually two returning guests that we had on the show just recently, Eric Siegel and Greg Kilstrom. Both are accomplished speakers and authors, with Eric specializing more in machine learning and Greg in customer experience, marketing, and, and digital transformation more broadly. And today we'll be talking about how to leverage agile principles to unlock and tap into the full potential that artificial intelligence brings to the table. Eric, Greg, welcome back to the show. It's a real pleasure having you both here with us today. Yeah, good Thanks to be for here. having me, Tim. As I said, uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining us again. Both of the conversations that we had initially with, with both you, Greg, and you, Eric, were really great. So, so I thought it would be really neat to have you both on to discuss this topic that kind of connects, connects both of your expertise. So I want to start with this. And maybe, Greg, you can lead here. And, and Eric, you, you can also add your thoughts. But I want Greg to, to start off. Why is being agile so important and so valuable in today's digital economy? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think it's it's definitely a cliche that the pace of change continues to increase, but it doesn't make it untrue just because it's a cliche, right? So, you know, I think first to say, and and when we talk about agile, there's there's a lot of ways of of looking at this. I am not a dogmatic, you know, you've got to use Scrum and do this, this, and this on these certain days. Like it's, there are people, there are places that do that. There are people that, that believe strongly in that. It can be a religion, in my opinion, if you if you adhere to it too strongly. But I think what anyone and everyone should adapt and, and adopt are the principles of being more agile. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak mainly to that and, and certainly Eric, you know, curious your, your thoughts on that as well. But, you know, I, I think, you know, the principles of agility are things that can be applied to, to any company and they help us listen to our customers. They help us work together more collaboratively. And, you know, there's 12 official principles, but, you know, really when I think about it, it's, you know, how do we do those things and how do we continuously improve and, ad improve and adapt over time? And if you happen to implement according to a very specific framework or methodology or whatever, you know, however you apply it, that's great. But being agile is important because things are not going to stop changing and organizations don't stop collecting data. They don't stop making new decisions and they need a feedback loop to be able to make better better and better decisions and learn from the past. Eric, any thoughts here? Well, I mean, I think agility is absolutely key for any machine learning project and AI in general, depending on how you define that, but certainly with generative AI. You know, in my new book, The AI Playbook, I present a practice called BizML and it's a six-step iterative practice, which requires a lot of backtracking and iteration, it, it's experimental. When you're doing data analysis of any kind, it's an experimental venture and you need to try certain things out and then go back to the business people and say, well, we can't quite pursue this predictive modeling. We don't have quite enough of the right data. We're not getting the results that we need. So that iteration, as much as it needs to be led by the business objective and the deployment goal also needs to incorporate that kind of agile response as you iterate, as you try things out. I think, but there's a slippery slope here too, because the main problem with machine learning projects and most enterprise machine learning projects fail to reach deployment. The main syndrome, the problem, the error that's repeated, the pitfall everyone falls into repeatedly is to jump right into the number crunching very rapidly. Let's just make a model and then we're going to deploy it to help retain customers or mitigate our fraud management or whatever it is, instead of having sort of a proper business practice. So 
in the one hand, you want things to move quickly, but you also need to make sure it's within that an established business structure, a paradigm, a, a playbook, where you're pursuing, ensuring that you're pursuing business value by paving a path well planned towards deployment from the get go. Even if there, you also need to allow for that agile iteration along the way. So, so basically, if you want agile principles to to help you alleviate the the biggest downsides and pitfalls of ai technologies you need to implement agile in the right way i guess yeah exactly be agile in the right way <laughs> yeah so, so do you have any words on like what that might be or m maybe both of you both greg and eric yeah i mean i can just to kind of mirror what eric was saying you know the the concept of business value so, you know, I think misconceptions about agile approaches are that it can be reactive versus methodical and, you know, scientific, if you will, in how it's approached. And so, yeah, Eric, to what you were saying, it's like, absolutely, like, it's got to start with what does the business need? And then what it, what does value mean to the business? And then optimize according to that iteratively, not just, hey, we're going to figure, you know, we're going to build the plane as we fly it or, or whatever, you know, whatever cliche is is often said in in those failed projects, Eric. You probably know more about that than than me on the on the on the AI and ML side. But you know, I, I do think it it comes back. There's got to be a foundation for it, or else how do you even know what success looks like? Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm more a machine learning person, and I've been in the field more than thirty years, and you two are certainly more agile than I am, and I, I don't mean that necessarily on the football field. I just mean, <laughs> yeah. He, um, no. <laughs> uh, well, let me let me just real briefly outline this six step practice the way I define it because I would love for the agile community to look at that and be like, okay, look, the agile principles apply within that framework. But from the machine learning perspective, this is where we see the the failure, and it's 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 more than just okay, look, you need the structure to plan the business value. It's more specific than that. It's the value proposition, which in the case of deploying a machine model, learning model is a pair of things. What's predicted and what's done about it? Which customer is going to cancel in order to target retention? Which transaction is most likely to be fraudulent in order to decide which transactions to block or, or audit? So you're driving millions of decisions, and that's at the heart of all the large-scale operations with probabilities, with predictions, with the scores that are output by predictive models that have been generated over data. So it's a very particular endeavor that really requires a specialized business practice that plans from the get-go that pair, what's predicted, what's done about it. That's the deployment goal. The second step, and that's only the literally the first step. And then the second step is to define more specifically, what are you predicting? Because it's it's got to be defined very detailed, not just who's going to cancel, which customer is going to quit, but you know which customers who've been around at least two months, who have been spending at least this at this level, will decrease their spend by eighty percent within the specific time frame of three months, and not increase their spend elsewhere in a different channel because that doesn't really count as losing the customer, et cetera. So all those caveats and qualifiers, it becomes a semi-technical yes/no question prediction goal in many cases. And it's got to be informed from business side considerations. Step three is defining exactly the metrics that are going to apply, how well it predicts, and how much value it'll generate. And then the last three steps are the technical steps that define any machine learning initiative since the 60s for credit scoring and targeting marketing, which is prep the data, apply the machine learning. That's the rocket science part, learn from the data and then deploy that model, actually integrate the predictions into the operations so they change, that they potentially, hopefully improve. And that's the culminating step, that's the deployment, that's what you have been planning from step one, from the get-go. So that framework, I call it BizML, those six steps. And it's very specialized for what it means to integrate predictions and plan for that into operations. And the only way you get predictions is from machine learning and the machine learning depends on data. So it's all the particulars around that, that use of that technology from a business standpoint, not just the, the rocket science, but the actual launch of the rocket. So within that framework, go. Like, tell me what your, how agile best practices sort of, what does it mean to you within that framework, because there is a lot of backtracking on those six steps. Oh, this doesn't quite work. we got to revisit. And the whole thing has got to be very deeply collaborative between the tech and business, between the data scientists and the stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can take a stab. I mean, again, you know, we already talked about the, the 
business value driving it. So, you know, we'll, won't we'll repeat there. You know, I mean, I look at the beginning of, if we just look at things in terms of sprints and, you know, we're going to accomplish one set of work in a certain period of time, that could be brand new work, or that could be revisiting something that needs to be improved and, and iterated upon. But at the beginning of that, I look at that as, well, you know, what's the hypothesis that we're, you know, proving, disproving. It doesn't sound dissimilar to what you're talking about either, which is, you know, again, how do we know that we're achieving or, or not achieving? And then if we do achieve, sure, move to the next step. If we if we're not, we, you know, we redo, we revisit, we retest and all that. I mean, that's a very, that's a gross simplification of what you just laid out, of course, but it's like, if you think about it in in small enough increments, that's that's essentially what it is. It's just a series of okay, we're gonna we're gonna do one thing or multiple things, test, see if it works based on our hypothesis, and then either again move move forward or move laterally. And and that that framework around agile with where you establish a hypothesis, that applies for any any kind of project, even outside AI. Is that right? I mean, so, yeah, I've done some very simplistic, you know, like are people are more people going to open emails, you know, in a marketing context or whatever, right. but there's still a hypothesis, you know, you're, I think I you're talking about much more complex hypotheses in, in a lot of these cases, but you know, it's still, it still stands. Well, the hypothesis, I, I guess, if you want to put in those terms is, you know, do we have enough do, with the data we already have, because normally you're operating on found data. So the data that was already naturally accrued in the course of conducting transactions or business as usual, no experimental design, no collection of data for this project. That's typical, not always. So with the data we have now, can we generate a model that predicts well enough, better, significantly enough better than guessing, because we don't have a magic crystal ball, but better than guessing is usually significant, to improve this operation, such as how auditors spend their time investigating transactions for fraud or any, you know, which satellite should we investigate is potentially running out of battery, which train wheel might fail. You know, there's there's a million different operations in order to make a dent, a meaningful dent in terms of KPIs, right? So that's sort of the hypothesis. It turns out that in the vast majority of time, the answer is yes. We, I mean, because any large scale operation, you're already collecting the data that you need because it's a large scale operation. So we have plenty of examples, both positive and negative from which to learn. The, the, the failure comes in the fact that there is a lack of, of business planning because there's that lack of business practice that I frame as biz ML. And, and a lack of stakeholder understanding of the semi-technical machinations so that they can collaborate deeply across all six steps. So ironically, if the hypothesis is, is this business ready to implement a predictive model to deploy it, then unfortunately the answer is often no. And you find out repeatedly the hard way. Yeah, yeah. And I I mean, I, I would just say the the trick is to make the question small enough that we get to, you know, the real, the fundamental reason why it's not, because yeah, to your point, if, I mean, the, that's where the null hypothesis, you know, it's like if we have enough data, but we can't find any statistically significant results from that data, then we could have all the data in the world, but, you mm -hmm. know, who cares? So yeah, I think it's breaking it into small enough chunks to start so that we start finding, we start poking the holes in the wall before we build the rest of the wall i guess mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah and so maybe eric you're you're the right person to to lead with on this next question what would you say are the main pitfalls that leaders should be mindful of and keep top of mind when they're trying to you know adopt some of these principles to really tap into ai and ml well i think the main pitfall as i mentioned is is jumping right into the number crunching the modeling the application machine learning on your existing data before addressing the sort of pre-production business steps with a holistic business practice playbook paradigm that that joins together in deep collaboration with business stakeholders such as the line of business manager in charge of running the operations meant to be improved with predictions and planning from the get-go for that deployment not just the idea of hey we want to retain customers but much more precisely we're going to engage a new targeted marketing meant to retain customers who are at high risk of defection and everything involved with that 
needs to be part of the goal. It's not just the, the rocket science. It's how that rocket's going to get launched. It's not just the number crunching. It's how you're going to actually use predictions to change or implement a new business operation. So, you know, it's a consulting gig, not a technology deploy or install. Right. You know, you might have like a, some new database system that you don't have to do that many, many business changes. People kind of under the covers can change the, the technology and all of a sudden the database operates two or 10 times as quickly. Great. But that's not what this is. These enterprise machine learning projects are meant to improve your existing large scale business operations. So that's change. It requires change management and planning for that change from the get go. So everyone wants to be fast. But I guess there's a difference between fast and agile, right? I mean, you can't, I mean, you can, right, do a preliminary, spend a few days pulling together a preliminary data and try out modeling, but know the whole time that this doesn't count because there, nobody's going to deploy it. I mean, this is what happens over and over again is the d data scientists get the green light, but the powers that be haven't really fully wrapped their head around the fact that this isn't just, just because you're using the best, coolest, most advanced, most potent technology doesn't mean you're actually establishing value. You may be creating value, but capturing it requires change to business operations. And that's what the project needs to revolve around. Greg, any thoughts here maybe? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like that you made the distinction between fast and agile mm -hmm. because I, I agree. It's like, Agile is often faster to some kind of result, but it's not always faster to the end result that we want to, you know, that we thought of, you know, way back when, when we first started talking, sometimes it is in many, in many cases it can be, but it's not a guarantee. There's a, when done well, there's a higher likelihood that you'll get to the end result versus planning a 10 year transformation project that goes nowhere or never launches or, or whatever as well. But again, none of it's a foregone conclusion. And I, and I do think, you know, that, that, and the idea that the misconception that agile is simply a reactive process to, to things versus a more, you know, essentially using the scientific method on a, you know, on a recurring basis to get to, you know, to get the right answers to the right thing. Like, I think those are some misconceptions that people, again, they rush to things. They they think they're being agile, but really they're, I don't know, they're throwing caution to the wind and like just doing stuff. Yeah, just just yeah. doing doing stuff. They can say that they're agile and they can be calm about that. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the life of a researcher, right? I mean, when I was in graduate school, and this is decades ago, that was the thing. I would get a great idea and then I could spend the weekend just implementing it all by myself, no bottlenecks, right? See how well it works. Right. But there's a big difference between sort of showing that number crunching can potentially create a, a model and an enterprise actually changing operations by using the model. So I'd really like to turn a question to you two. I've kind of turned the conversation more towards predictive AI, predictive AI analytics, those types of predictive enterprise use cases of machine learning. And that's the focus of my book and a lot of my work and, and most of the sort of machine learning community up till a couple of years ago. Now, a, a lot of the, obviously the public attention has turned to generative AI, which is really apples and oranges. I mean, in generative AI, you're using it to create a new content item, such as writing a draft writing, draft piece of code, a draft image that generally needs a human in the loop. I think that we're still waiting for the killer app. And I think some people would say, you know, coding is a killer app, but I mean killer app in terms of the expectations that have been set publicly, which are much broader than that. And I, and I think they may be hard to meet, but there's certainly value in first drafts, huge amount of value in terms of efficiencies. My question to you, and you can answer it as well as I, because it's the wild, wild west now. I, there's, there's nothing there, in terms of enterprise value. There's not that much to know about generative AI because it doesn't require that kind of understanding of what it means to act on probabilities. It's a very different use of machine learning under the covers. And in the end, it's super accessible. You use natural language and you generate prompts. Or you as a human create prompts and see what it gives you. How do you apply agile concepts if you're an enterprise, and this is what all enterprises are asking, how do we jump on the bandwagon? How do we make value out of this? What's the proper agile approach? Yeah, I mean, I can start to, at least to agree with you there, like AI, very broad umbrella of things. And these days when someone says AI, they're 
probably if they don't know better they're probably just referring to chat gpt even not even to be as broad as generative but yeah. but like it, to actually talk about ai or even just to talk about generative ai i mean i apply i mean i work with plenty of companies and and enterprises that are looking into this stuff exactly as you're saying and they're you know most of them are they're you know with a wink and a nod they are jumping on the bandwagon i mean they want to be strategic as they can but they know they're jumping on the bandwagon it's like anything I, you know, test and learn, right? So it's like, okay, first, what are, why are we testing and learning? You know, what's, what's the, what's the business objective we're trying to achieve? And then, okay, what, what are the tools available? What's it going to gain us? You know, it's a lot of efficiency gains and even a first draft to your point, like that's an efficiency gain. It's most of it's not ready for prime time yet. So it's not something that's almost nothing is going to, you know, reach a customer directly at this point unless there's some serious guardrails in place but i would also say i mean to me the fun stuff the most fun stuff that i'm working on right now is combinations of well what would we do if we combine predictive with generative mm -hmm. the to me that's some of the fun stuff that again exploratory and r d phase on on a lot of this stuff but it's that's where i think it gets exciting because then we get to we get to play with okay the one of the biggest problems that i see is that feedback loop of like we collect data and have dashboards mountains of dashboards but no, then we never do anything with it what if our predictive feeds us first drafts of things and then we get closer to actually completing the feedback loop right can you be a little more specific like what would be an example of combining them yeah. So, you know, to predict churn, you know, customer churn, let's say. So, you know, we have all the data, we understand, we have a we have a target for customer lifetime value. We see somebody's taking the actions to churn and we want to prevent that. So, okay, let's generate an email to them that is, okay, hey, Greg, you know, a custom offer, content, whatever. It's not, you can do that at a broad level and just say anyone likely to churn gets this one email, but we've all received those and probably you know, close them. So like to be able to do stuff like that, where it's hyper personalized based on predictive intelligence. And you think that I'm a, a, a product is a good fit for one particular customer, but they're taking actions that actually say, well, you know what, they need this whole other product that you sell, move them into an entirely different journey, you know, buyer's journey. And you know everything about them from their previous experience. So let's hyper-personalize that as well. So, you know, that's, I think to me, that's some, that's some exciting stuff. Again, what, what the generative generates right now may mm -hmm. not be, may take a little human oversight for the time being, but I, I think we're in, in short periods of time, probably it's going to be ready for prime time. I don't know. I think it might be several years. So it would sort of scope the definition of what you're referring to. You said, as you said, reaching customers directly and this customized message, if you want to scale, right, over hundreds of thousands of customers that are at risk of defection, right, uh, you can't have the human in the loop if, you, if you're really trying to use technology in a, a cost-effective way. And if you think the effectiveness of the retention message would be increased by having it totally personalized automatically with Gen AI, that's the question is when is that ready for prime time? Much the same as a specialized chat bot to rebook right. a flight. That one actually might be hairier, but let's pick another example because that's there's some hairy stuff, I think, in the air <laughs> air travel industry. But let's say, you know, how do I fix my dishwasher? And then there's a bunch of specialized knowledge and the advantage that the chat bot, you know, can handle however the customer wants to talk in casual human language. I think those two are kind of analogous because they're both very constrained kind of topic areas. So there is some feasibility that yeah. it will become ready for prime time. I have a lot of skepticism and I covered on both of your podcasts, uh, especially this. And I, when I was on, both of you hosted me on, on your podcast previously. On this podcast with Tim, I really got into that. Mm -hmm. We were really, I just revisited that episode yesterday and we had a lot of fun just deconstructing the overhype mm -hmm. and the problems with it. And along those lines, just the idea that a general purpose chat bot about any topic. But when you start to hone the topic down, then the question is, when's it ready for prime time? When you kind of get it under control it's it's trustable, it's trustworthy in that it'll have the right answer as 
often as you would hope the best human expert would, and it won't come up with incorrect information any more than you would hope from the best human expert, right? So something like that, and it's parameterized, it's constrained, it's only a limited information. Now we have the holy grail that generative AI has been promising, right? So you're like, it'll be pretty soon. And I'm like, Man, I don't know. So I think it'll be several years. A lot of people are acting like it'll be several months. And that's a really big difference, right? Yeah, so I mean, for what it's worth, soon to me is is a, about a year or two. So yeah, yeah. like, I not no, I don't, I don't think that your opinion is crazy at all. A lot of my friends are there, and I'm not completely like, oh, it's all baloney. It'll never happen, you know. And, and on, on on a broad scale, the difference between one and six years isn't that great, obviously. So, but right. it is a question, and no, we don't. It is a research. It's not just product development. It's a re open research issue. So in the meantime, I don't know, what are the what are the agile methods to help companies sort of test out whether it's ready for prime time for their particular use case in a way that's cost effective? Yeah, so I mean, some of this is just risk mitigation too. So, you know, like what what are the factors that could go wrong? I mean, you know, so the enterprise platforms that that I'm familiar with, you know, they're trained only on the enterprise's data. So, you know, they're not going to go out and hallucinate to, you know, to your earlier point, it's like, the more we can limit the the question that's being asked and the answer that's being given, you know, it, mm -hmm. it helps us tremendously. So, you know, if I go and ask an airline's chat bot, like, hey, what medication should I take for my, you know, XYZ, like, that's a, that's just a mismatch of, of both of those things. But if I ask a software company like, hey, where do I find the menu item for this button in your software, yeah. that becomes easier and easier. You know, some sometimes it's to the point of not being terribly useful, but, you know, you, you I think you get the point. So, like, I, I think some of that is actually it's actually ready already. Like if you're only training on a very subset of mm -hmm. of, of information and again, you're limiting the questions that can be asked. I think that's already ready, but that's that's a that's a pretty simple use case. That's well, and I would I would argue that that particular that that a use case that's that well scoped, there's a big question of whether it's worth generative AI because it's right. already you're getting just as much value just from search. Yeah, yeah. So then, so then to you know to your question, it's like, well, how do we make how do we make an investment in something that's bigger than, yeah, then some, either, either search or just a simple, if then, you know, algorithm, you know, cause you can do a chat bot like that too. You know, how do we do something a little bit more, but not so much that we're going to get either errors or some other kind of risk, you know, just customer dissatisfaction or, or, or something like that. So it's, I mean, again, it's kind of back to like, let's, let's take a step forward test and, and just keep pushing, pushing, pushing to, I think to your other point, that's costly and that may not be worth it until we have reasonable confidence that we can take a big enough step that it's actually going to save time and increase customer satisfaction, lifetime value, all, all those, whatever our KPIs are. So in that way, that's another factor in, is it ready for prime time? Because again, if if we can do it is one question, but should we do it is, is a much bigger one, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really answering your question, I guess, but it's sort of, it's maybe that's the spirit of the, 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 well, again, I, did I say earlier, I kind of consider this a wild, wild west, right? Yeah. Everyone's an expert. Nobody's an expert. <laughs> wow. That was right. well said. Right. <laughs> this has been such a fascinating and awesome conversation. I, I love, I'm loving that. I'm just basically letting you two talk and discuss <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I figured that, that, you know, the, the more I, I, I try to budge into, into your conversation, the less cool insights we'll get, <laughs> but just, just to, you know, to, to start driving everything to a close, do you have any final tips uh, for listeners who are maybe, you know, trying to implement agile, trying to, to implement agile, to unlock the potential of AI at their companies, but are maybe having a hard time with doing that or having a hard time with, with seeing real value out of all this. Maybe, maybe Eric, you can lead here. It's such a, a trite saying that you got to lead with the business objective, the business intention. And what I was saying about predictive, where you got to start with a deployment goal, which is what's predicted and what's done about it. The same basic concept applies for any generative project. It's not just like put some intelligence into your operations. It's got to be like, okay, we are going to draft 
more, more customized retention messages. We're going to give new customer service agents who operate on a chatbot draft paragraphs for them to consider altering and copy pasting into their customer. You know, it's got to be a very specific deployment goal, a very specific operation, operational way that the new generated content's going to be used. If you're going to systematically get your coders to use draft code, it's one thing for an individual coder to, in an ad hoc way, experiment and see what, what works best for them. And that may be a large part of it. But if you're trying to sort of systematically get it across your entire population of engineers, again, it's, it's, a, it's a very tricky thing to define exactly how you're going to try to instill and define best practices and what scope of what type of coding does it make sense for. So these things need to really, really be well-defined before you even sort of give a trial deployment trial initiative a chance yeah that makes a lot of sense greg any tips yeah i mean you know what he said but also mm -hmm. to go back to you know definitely agree with the, the business value part of it i would just also recommend just you know when you're planning things i mean don't forget that this is a this can be a scientific process of you know trial and hypothesis and and all of that and it really should be you know it's it, Again, don't get lost in this, like we can be really quick and agile and, you know, agile in, in a small a agile, I guess, or whatever, you, however <laughs> you want to say it. To be agile is not to, you know, to mirror what we were saying earlier, mm -hmm. like it's not necessarily to be quick, it's it's to get iteratively to the right answer in the best way possible. That was an awesome way to put it. And, and I love how we kind of went full circle and then and, and circle back to, to some of the initial points that we made about, about fast versus agile. And, and I really loved getting both of your perspectives. I think I think that they both really enriched the conversation. Oh, thanks. So yeah, just, just before we, we wrap things up and jump off the call, if listeners would like to learn more about you or connect with, with the both of you, where can they do that, Greg? Yeah, sure. So I'm really active on LinkedIn. So, you know, look me up, Greg Kilstrom on LinkedIn. You can also go to my website just at theagilebrand.com. Awesome. Eric? So my book, The AI Playbook, just came out a couple of months ago, which espouses that bizml practice, ml.com. And I've been running this conference series, Machine Learning Week, previously Predictive Analytics World, since 2009. Our conference in the U.S., is June 4th through 7th in Phoenix, Arizona, and then in November in Munich. And we have a new sister conference, Generative AI Applications Summit. So those two conferences are co-located the first week of June in Phoenix. Awesome. I think this should go live just before, just a few weeks before the first conference. You said that it was at the beginning of June, so that this will be yeah. great timing. And we'll make sure to link everything in the show notes together with both of your episodes in our show that we already did. So that listeners oh, who haven't heard either can, you know, also revisit and kind of get like the whole perspective from both of you. So thanks again, Eric, Greg. It was really great having you both on. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks, thanks Tim. So much. Thanks. And to our listeners, that's all for this episode. Have a great day, everyone. And stay safe. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to check out our other episodes, you can find all of them at agiledrop.com slash podcast, as well as on all the most popular podcasting platforms. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any new episodes, and don't forget to share the podcast with your friends and colleagues.